How do we make marriage easy? Because this is something, this is the way of shaitan. You know what the way of shaitan is? Shah Waliul Adahalbi rahimahullah put it so brilliantly. The way of shaitan in a society is you make the haram easy and you make the halal difficult. That, and when that happens in a society, shaitan is one. Because people will gravitate towards what is easy. So today, if you want pleasure for your eyes, what can you capture on a screen, Where the places you can go, the access that you have at, at your workplace, at your campuses, you know, on your mobile devices, on social media platforms, on dating apps, you name it. All of that has become easy. And while the door to haram, to fulfill, because human beings, men will have desire for women, that's something Allah put inside them. It's not gonna go away. Women will want companionship. It's something Allah put inside, it's in their nature. That's why families come together anyway. When that is the door to the unhealthy, the, the filthy, the impermissible is wide open. And then that young man comes to his parents and says, I think I need to get married. I know I'm only in my third year of college, but this is getting out of hand, mom. This is getting out of hand, dad. I think, I, and he doesn't say, dad, my hormones are driving me crazy. Man, the girls on campus, I don't even know what to tell you. Seriously though, you know, this one girl keeps texting me out. He's not gonna talk like that to his dad or his mom. He's just gonna say, mom, I think I need to get married. He's gonna code it in a nice way. And then what do parents do? They humiliate this young man. Oh, can't hold it in, huh? Can't control yourself? Well, I was 40 when I got married and your father starts giving you lectures. You know, like, how are you 40? You're 50 now. <laughs> you know, so what we've done as parents oftentimes is oppress and suppress what naturally Allah put inside of us, especially in a time when the haram is wide open, then you have to go out of your way to make the halal easy. You have to go out of your way and you can only battle the haram by, by opening the doors to the halal. And to be able to say to our young men and women, this door is open for you, before you ever even think about making a mistake, come talk to us, let us know. Look, your family pride, you know, you wanted, to, you wanted your son or daughter to marry somebody within the, within the race, within the city, within the village, you know, within the extended cousins, God knows what, what you had in mind for them, you had all these dreams for them. If you wanted to have them marry within the village, why didn't you stay in the village? Why did you bring them here? Why did you let them go to college? Why, didn't you, let them, why did you let them see the world? You didn't put, you, you're trying to pretend that the world is still what, what it was, it's not. The world has changed. The world was even different from the Makkah and Sahaba when they moved to Medina. The Sahaba noticed these are not like women of Makkah, this is different. Society was different for them. When people migrate, there's a new society. And we have to adapt to that. And to refuse to accept that is a form of oppression. It actually goes against the ayah that says, allow people to get married. Open that door up. Which comes to the next point. When some proposal comes your way, you have daughters. Like I have daughters. May Allah Azza wa help all of us who have daughters. You know, oh, and sons too, I'll throw them in the dua. But you know like, <laughs> but if, the, if you have daughters and some proposal comes, she's of the age, it's a good match, she likes him, it's okay to ask, do you like him? It's not, it's not haram to ask, it's actually an important thing to ask, do you like him? She says, I don't like how he looks. Done, finished. You can't force them anymore. I don't like, I'm not attracted to him. Astaghfirullah. That will come, Allah will put it in your heart. No, it won't. That's not how it works. If she says, I don't like him, he's too fat, he's too short, he's ugly, I'm, you know, I don't like his personality, whatever she says. She doesn't even have to give you a reason. She doesn't, she could just say no, that's it. وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ Don't force your young girls to rebellion. That's the phrase in the Qur'an. Don't force your young girls to rebellion. And the immediate inter interpretation actually of it was, don't make young women go into prostitution. Because in Medina, that's what they did with slave women. They used them for, for, to make money off of them as pimps. And they used to literally pimp them in the streets. That's what they did. And Qur'an came and spoke against that. But the phrasing Allah used wasn't just about prostitution. He made it wide open. Why is it wide open? When you force a woman to get married to someone she doesn't want to marry, when you put you know, emotional pressure on her and say, if you don't marry him, nobody's gonna marry you, your family's gonna be humiliated, we've already printed the cards. When you do this kind of thing to your girls and you get them married, and then emotionally they're not in that marriage. 
they're still human beings. A human being still needs companionship. A human being still wants somebody who, who they can be attracted to, who they can find comfort in. That desire does not go away. And that desire will now be fulfilled by fantasy, by them thinking about things, by late night going on social media, by other things. You force them into rebelling against Allah because you force them into a marriage they didn't want to begin with. This is لا تكره فتياتكم على البغاء also. Don't push this on your, on your daughters. But coming back, this is about men and about women. The young men of our community actually have to now stand up for themselves and have to say, I'm ready to get married. And I have somebody in mind. And that's, that's the next thing I want to share with you. You know, when it comes to, you want a marriage that lasts forever. Like we, wanna, we want our boy to have the perfect girl. Good luck with that, by the way. Uh, because perfection is not going to happen in this, and your boy isn't perfect. Let me, let me tell you. If you don't know, let me tell you. We're all human beings, and human beings have flaws, and sometimes, sometimes things work, and sometimes things don't work. But let me tell you, when a young man and a young woman are old enough to get married, that actually means they're old enough to make their own choice. Let me repeat myself. When they're old enough to get married, they're old enough to make their own choice. And maybe you don't like their choice. And your job and my job as parents is to advise them and say, I don't think this is a good choice. I think that this is, you could do better. I, and, and you're, by the way, as a parent, I think I'm always going to say you could do better. I'm always going to say that. But maybe, and maybe you think this is a mistake. But if your son is 25 years old, your daughter is 30 years old, and she wants to make a mistake, that halal mistake is way better. That halal mistake is way, way, and it, maybe things don't work out in three years. That's still better. That's still better than you refusing, because I have seen enough cases, I don't talk in theory, I'm talking based on what I've seen, the conversations I've had with people, with real Muslim families around the world, especially around the United States and Canada, where people are, this, this man comes and says, I want to marry this girl. The father says, no, you're not from the same country, you're not from the same culture or whatever. You can't get married to my daughter, or the other way around, but these two are still already emotionally attached, so they're texting each other, talking to each other, hanging out with each other, having dinner with each other, parents don't know, five, six years go by, they're refusing other proposals, then the girl is forced to marry somebody else, and she's still talking to the guy. And all of this was that, that evil, that evil, that this whoever she married didn't deserve this. He didn't deserve this. But all of that evil was created by the stubbornness of parents who didn't realize that their children live in a different time. Where, where allowing marriage first is a bigger priority than anything else. You have to understand, when these ayat came down, they came down in Medina. And the Arab people are a, of the time especially were very tribal. They wanted to maintain their nasab at all costs. You maintain your lineage. Lineage is a very, very big deal. So marrying outside your tribe was not a common thing. But now the Sahaba are in Medina. And they're outcasts from their own city anyway. And a lot of the people that were in Medina, they've accepted Islam, so they're outcasts from their own tribes. So there are going to be marriages outside of their culture. You have to understand, it's not just an Arab marrying an Arab. You know? This, this was a big deal to them. But Allah said, no, forget all of that. Just make sure that marriage itself becomes easy. Just that much. And Allah will take care of the rest. وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Allah says, you better try to hold on as best as you can away from the haram. Do your hardest, do your best to stay away from the impermissible, no, how, no matter how tempting, how beautiful, how emotionally you know, attractive it becomes. How justified it becomes in your mind, stay away from it as best you can. Those of you that cannot find a means to get married, لا يجدون نكاحا Because that temptation is going to eat up, eat, eat away at you. And you'll be a believer on the outside. And when it comes to this kind of behavior, iman is out the window. Remember the words of your Prophet wasallam. لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن When somebody commits adultery, when somebody does the ultimate shameless act, at the time they're doing it, they're no longer a believer. They're no longer a believer. This is the words of our Prophet ﷺ. You better hold on and protect yourself from the road to haram. The first moment you find the opportunity to take the halal option, you take it. You take it. And our, the, the first, notice in these ayat, the first conversation was actually to the community and to the society. They were supposed to make things easier. 
And by the way, today in our times, that is the role of the masjid. Where are good Muslims going to meet other good Muslims? You tell me, at the mall? Where are they going to meet? At the hookah place? Where, where are they going to find each other? If our families, families, men, women, children, if they start coming to the masajid, then families start getting to know each other and connections start forming. That is actually one of the fundamental roles of the masjid, especially in a society where the majority of the people are not believers. That's what's supposed to happen. It's okay if somebody saw outside after Jum'ah, somebody was going to park their car, and some young man saw some woman and said, Oh, mom, can you find out about her? It's completely fine. Actually, it's better. It's better that happens here than anywhere else. That's actually the case. You know, you find in our history, there were, there were women that used to run orphanages in Medina. Women muhaddithat would run orphanages. And they would take the, the, these orphan girls, it's a girl's orphanage, there are no fathers. Nobody's gonna go look for a nikah for them, or a you know, possible match for them, or a proposal for them. Nobody knows they exist, they're orphans. So this, this muhaditha, this scholar used to take, in Medina, she used to take all these orphan girls, 18, 19, 20 year old girls, she'd take them out shopping every day, to get groceries. You don't need 20 girls to go groceries, but she would. Why would she do that? And then people started complaining, there's fitna in the street, in the market. All these young girls outside. You know, people say this nowadays, there's a big fitna at the Islamic convention, all these young girls in the bazaar, astaghfirullah al -Azim. You don't, You don't complain fitna in the movie theater. You've never complained fitna in the mall. You've never complained fitna on campus. At the Islamic convention, there's fitna. Everywhere else is, uh, you know, uh, Allah just opened the blessings for you. MashaAllah, they went shopping. You know? So people complain, there's fitna. And what did she say? Why do you do this? She said, so I can hunt down the young men of Medina. Because when she goes shopping for carrots, the guy at the cash register is going to fall in love and say, I want to find out about her. And he's going to marry, because who's going to marry these orphan girls? Who's going to marry them if, they know, if nobody's even seen them? Nobody's ever even been interested in them. There are legitimate ways by people getting introduced to each other. Some of us are so conservative, we're so protective of our women, that we want them to become invisible. That is not the way Medina operated. And some of us are so liberal and so open, oh yeah, they want to go out to dinner, go ahead. Oh, just come back before midnight. Really? That's insane. What are you, what are you thinking? What are you doing? This is not, the khalwa is open doors for shaitan. So we've got these two extremes and now we've got to come back to the middle. Allow young people to meet in a dignified fashion with the knowledge of their families and if there is mutual interest, then it's okay. The only marriage proceedings mentioned in the Quran are that of Musa alayhi salam. Like from zero to 100, like finding a girl and getting married to a girl. You know, that whole spectrum is captured in the story of Musa alayhi salam. Just a few things about that. First and foremost, he's, a, he's from Banu Israel, yes? He's an Israelite. And he is homeless. He's a fugitive from the law. He ran from Egypt because he accidentally killed someone. So he's homeless, he's an Israelite, he's a fugitive. He ends up in an Arab, Arab tribe, Madian. He ends up in Arab land where he finds a couple of girls, and he helps them. And one of the girls indirectly told her father she's interested in him. And the father immediately said yes. And they got married. So an Israeli got married to an Arab in the Qur'an. And the one from Israel was also homeless and a fugitive from the law. The only thing the father needed to see was قويون, three things. One, the girl's interested. That was number one. She liked him. Number two, he's strong. He's got good character, good qualities in him. He can do a job. He can make money. He can defend my family. And then he's trustworthy. He had plenty of opportunity to do the wrong thing. He did no such thing. He carried himself with dignity. When you have these three qualities, ethnicity didn't matter. Financial status didn't matter. None of that mattered. None of that mattered. As a matter of fact, in this case, if nowadays when you say this, it sounds suicidal, for 10 years, between 8 and 10 years, Musa salam lived with his in-laws and worked for his father-in-law. And his paycheck came from his in-laws. Today when you say to somebody, hey, where do you work? Oh, I work for my father-in-law. And I live with them too. <laughs> well, what a, what a guy. This is a real man? This is a man even? He lives with his in-laws? You want to question the manhood of Musa salam? Try what, see what happens to you. 
Because you don't want to get punched by that man, alayhi salam. What I'm saying is there are sometimes unusual situations. And Allah mentions them on purpose in the Qur'an because sometimes the marriage is going to be under unusual situations. Not every situation can be ideal. And in your family, if there's an unusual situation, don't sit there and cry, why couldn't we have a normal kind of situation? That's okay. Life is not about normal. Actually, when you dig deep in every family, there's no such thing as normal. Every one of us is weird. Every one of us has strange situations in their family. So we have to adapt, and we have to be flexible, and we have to be merciful to our coming generation, allowing them to get married in a healthy way, and having that open conversation with our sons and with our daughters. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless this community with healthy marriages. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to do right by our children, and our children to do right by their children in raising children on Islam. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.